Hey everyone and welcome to my talk on Kubernetes deployment models at the edge. My name is Charlotte and I'm an engineering manager at Container Solutions. We're a cloud native um, consulting company and this is also where I've picked up most of the content that I'm going to be presenting today. Working on client projects, not all of them at the edge, but you pick up different things about Kubernetes on the way as well. Why am I doing this talk? There's often a big gap between, oh, we have this application and we can run it in a container. We have it properly containerized, so now how do we run it in production? This is where Kubernetes often comes in handy, but during my last project, I realized this is even more true for edge computing. So the gap from container to Kubernetes to Kubernetes at the edge gets increasingly larger. And at the edge, you have challenges that cloud computing might not have. So you have limited hardware, um, more or higher latency requirements, so the workloads will change and also the different things about communication between the edge and the cloud. So this gap just gets larger and larger and the instructions on how to move from step one to final version often tend to uh, go further apart. So it's, it's getting harder. And this talk is hopefully helping to bridge this gap a little bit by giving an idea on what the different options are for Kubernetes and how to go from here, this is how I have an application to, okay, this is how I can run my Kubernetes platform at the edge. Starting off with edge computing, why would we even need edge computing? Why don't we just use the cloud and stay there? Since this is a um, slightly telco focused conference, I'm guessing you already know this, but the edge is enabling lower latency workloads to run faster and run better and you have the closer to end user and device processing so you are enabling telco and other industries to provide better bandwidth better mobile connectivity and you're helping advanced use cases such as ar vr gaming iot faster streaming and many others with the edge and if I say edge computing, there's different definitions out there. So I'll run you through mine just so that we're on the same page when I'm using different terms that might not be the same or might not be understood the same by everybody. So if you're looking into edge computing, you'll run into mixed versions with frog computing and cloud computing and mist computing and cloudlets. And all of this can get a little confusing because it's just very different versions and people don't always have the same understanding. I personally find the one separating the different versions by which network they belong to and what kind of workloads they run makes the most sense. So basically you have the edge computing on the left here with um, the actual edge devices, which can be user equipment, so phones or laptops or cars, other sensors, sensors or IoT devices. And um, from those you go to the access networks, so base stations and gateways. And then there's a small overlap with the metro network where you have the private data centers and the central offices. And this is also where fog computing already takes. So fog computing is bridging the gap between the edge and the more traditional cloud seen on the right. So the hyperscalers like AWS or GCP. So you might not need fog computing in this context. So it could work with just edge and from the edge where the edge stops, the cloud starts. But I like the more softer way and for computing also giving you the thought about how would you even manage workloads that need to transition from the edge to the cloud. And that's it for these definitions. Now if we look at what an edge platform can look like. So we get this nice example from the Etsy um, standards group, what the expectations can be for an edge platform, because here we have the multi edge access edge computing or MEC reference architecture. And um, this is only one version and one example of what you might want from an edge platform. This is no definitive thing for everything. This is just a specific use case. But you can see you have two host machines. So the one in the middle and the one on the left and various management and orchestration pieces around it, taking care of um, the platform itself and the workloads. And this is just one of the many use cases but this is the one showcasing the complexities very nicely. So um, what things you might need to consider with a platform like this. This is a little too complex for this talk. So we're going to simplify this a bit. We separate the different layers into the underlying infrastructure. 
so the actual hardware servers or VMs including the OS this hardware side so while some might be running on bare metal and some might be running on VMs it doesn't matter all that much for this talk but some of the um, Kubernetes versions that we look at do need um, specific underlying not even Kubernetes versions, but they need specific underlying infrastructure like VMware or OpenStack to actually run their systems, which is not something that you can say for vanilla Kubernetes. So above that, you have the Kubernetes layer and above that, the workloads running on Kubernetes, ranging from edge workloads that as similar to before, like mobile gaming, AR, VR processing and others to general applications that are less edge um, specific. It can just be workloads that you might run on the cloud as well. And on the left, we have the orchestration and management of each of these three layers. And we will focus on the Kubernetes layer and on the orchestration and management of the Kubernetes layer, but also touch on the orchestration and management of the gray areas because they are often intertwined, so OpenShift, for example, the infrastructure and the orchestration of the platform comes with the same thing. Um, not every platform is like that, but it does touch on it, so this is why it's included. For more information on more complex examples and other reference architectures, you can check out the Acrino wiki, which is collecting all kinds of different blueprints and reference architectures. So these are helpful for understanding a little bit the ecosystem and what it actually looks like on the edge. Considering a large part of this talk is about Kubernetes, I'll work through the essentials first before getting too deep into the differences. For anybody who knows all this by heart, don't worry, it's not going to be a super long part. Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration tool, which is basically a fancy way of saying um, Kubernetes manages your workloads, your containers for you and makes sure they communicate properly. And it was initially started in 2014 based on a Google project and has been maintained by the CNCF since its creation in 2015. Its ideal use case is for applications in a microservices architecture and it provides various deployment, maintenance and scalability features while also providing an API, and this is important, that is expendable, extendable, not expendable, via custom resources to allow for additions to the core functionality by users. And this is important because this is one of the reasons Kubernetes is liked so much because you can add your own Kubernetes native things to Kubernetes while leaving the core functionality intact. So you're not breaking the actual Kubernetes by adding your own things on top. And a lot of the um, distros and Kubernetes flavors that we're looking at today actually do this. So they use custom resources to add their own spin to it. The architecture itself of Kubernetes works like this. So you have a control plane with different pieces that are responsible for workload and cluster management and orchestration. You have the API server, so basically the brain of the operation. You have the etcd, the storage behind the API server, the scheduler to determine where workloads will get scheduled, and the controller manager to implement one of the Kubernetes central patterns, so a control loop, to ensure that the current state matches the declared state. So making sure that if something is not as it's supposed to be, it changes it. And aside from the control plane components, we have the worker node components at the bottom, consisting of the kubelet and the kube proxy to facilitate the actual workloads in containers on the worker nodes. And in this example, the number of nodes and the control plane just being one single node is not an actual um, representation of a cluster. It's just exemplary for the reference. There are various different flavors and distributions out there. So this is a very brief and highly opinionated intro into the ones that we'll be touching on today. And if you check out the CNCF webpage, there is a list of dozens of um, Kubernetes conform, um, certified Kubernetes conform distros out there and flavors. The vanilla Kubernetes we already talked about, so this is the upstream original version, which is where the reference, uh, sorry, the architecture came from. Next thing are minimal versions, so very lightweight distros, so K0S and K3S. And when I say lightweight, I mean it's built as a very small binary, it's installed quicker, it uses less memory, 
usually often run as a single node cluster, it has simplified some of Kubernetes' default, like the, not using etcd, but still letting you use etcd, but the default is smaller. The enhanced versions are kind of Kubernetes plus, so built-in differences and or add-ons. So the Open Network Edge Service Software, or OpenNAS for short, is an edge and networking optimized Kubernetes with a central control plane. And Edge Nodes, so already a distributed version of it. Red Hat OpenShift is actually a suite of products, but we'll focus mostly on the OpenShift container platform. It is a commercial version of Kubernetes with a focus on enterprise-friendly default settings and add-ons, especially um, security-focused. Robin.io Cloud Native Platform is similar to openness built on Kubernetes, but also commercial and different networking optimizations and tools are added to handle multi-cluster management. There's the cloud distros and Amazon's Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS, and Google Cloud's Kubernetes Engine, GKE, are just two examples, though probably the most well-known ones from the cloud platforms out there. These are also based on Kubernetes, but you have a little bit less control over the actual control plane because that is managed by the cloud provider themselves. So you still can run your Kubernetes workloads as usual on them, but you might not be able to change everything on the control plane that you want because you also don't have access to the control plane, um, to your underlying system running the control plane. Specific edge focus is Google Anthos is actually a suite of different cluster options. It in itself is not that edge focused, but um, in the version that we're looking at it is. So we'll be focusing mostly on the GKE and bare metal clusters because those are the ones that I've worked with. Um, Mobile EdgeX is not really a Kubernetes distro. It's more of a management system, but it takes care of the cluster creation and workloads for you. So it's included to showcase some of the other aspects that matter during choosing a way of deployment. Kubedge is a different take on Kubernetes with a centralized control plane and the option to have cloud and remote edge nodes to all connect to that same control plane. So in a way it's similar to openness, but it is um, intended to be a more lightweight version as well. So to minimize the resource usage at the edge. OpenYurt is a not very mature but promising alternative to Kubedge and it is installable on an existing cluster with a central control plane and edge nodes. So basically turning your current cluster into an edge cluster. Now that we've seen the basic architecture of a cluster and that there are a range of different Kubernetes options out there, how do we actually figure out which is the right one for a specific use case? There's different things to consider. First and foremost, it's about the workloads or applications that are meant to run on the edge. So what kind of workloads you're running and planning for and what requirements are coming with those that can range from security aspects for different tenants to requirements for specific hardware acceleration. Same for sensor equipment or potential IoT use cases that might not be able to or even need to run full clusters. So if you only need to gather sensor data and forward it instead of processing, you might not need much processing power, so not that much space, so might not need a cluster at all. The hardware that you have available or can purchase for your edge or data center sites might be limited in terms of performance or number. So that can be potentially a good point for using VMs for cluster nodes instead of bare metal clusters. If you still want to separate tenants, for example, and you only have a limited number of bare metal nodes, VMs might also be a good thing. The connectivity and networking is another big aspect. Do you have specific requirements or limitations that you need to take into account from uh, VPNs to um, specific latency or specific uh, connections that you need to have or specific um, firewalls that you need to take into account? The existing infrastructure and ecosystem play a big role as well. So if you have licenses already and existing clusters or cloud infrastructures, they are definitely worth taking into account. Usually or very often companies don't want to switch something completely if they already built up something in one of the areas. If your team already has experience with Kubernetes, that should factor into your choices as well or at least the potential training and support should go into the planning phases of creating a platform like this. 
There'll also factor into the cost, same as running your own machines versus getting a pre-boxed version or using edge locations from telco operators. So basically using a hosted version instead of running it yourself. Those are considerations that a company needs to make by itself. And some companies, for example, prefer to use managed services, but others tend to go for more control and flexibility, but also more predictable cost. So let's start with the first range of options. How many clusters do you need and how do you control them? There's three different options on this slide to show the extremes. In reality, you're more likely to have a mix of them instead of just a single one. So reasons to have multiple standalone clusters can be different uh, Kubernetes versions. So you might need different Kubernetes versions for workloads. You might need different um, cluster-wide settings, separate clusters for security requirements, so specific tenants, especially things that can't be namespaced or um, isolated with RBAC and other um, security um, facilitation. And on the other hand, if you have less clusters, you have less overhead on the edge, but also less to manage. Then again, if your control plane, your central control plane goes down, that's it for you. If you have a, um, well, it does depend on the version, but we'll get into that. The first option on the left is having a central or admin cluster centrally or in the cloud, which may have different clusters at the edge locations, and those can be different kinds, but usually if you have a central cluster that is made to have clusters at the edge, it's the same version of it. So if it's pure Kubernetes or pure OpenShift or Anthos, often it's not one cluster managing different kinds of clusters. The second option is having a central cluster, but acting as a control plane to edge nodes instead of having control planes at the edge as well. So basically one large cluster with a control plane in a central location and the nodes either in the cloud or at the edge. And the third option on the right is skipping the central cluster entirely and just using another form of cluster management like ranchers fleet or proprietary management tools. This is not necessarily that different from the left one because even for your central cluster, you will still need some sort of cluster management. But if we look at them specifically, the first one, having a central cluster or admin cluster and edge clusters, that concept can be seen with Google Anthos. So you have an admin cluster and user clusters. You have OpenShift. OpenShift lets you use the Hive Sorry, it's used a Hive operator to um, run OpenShift clusters from a single OpenShift cluster, and Robin.io also lets you do that by having a specific system to create clusters from one cluster. And a DIY method would be running Kubernetes with cluster API in MetalCube to make sure you're provisioning the bare metal hosts and then adding clusters on top of that. For the, X edge, X, for the edge extension, we have options like openness, cube edge, and open yard. And the latter two are trying to have a smaller footprint for the edge nodes, and openness mostly adds functionality to vanilla Kubernetes on top, so additional resources are needed. The way the extensions work is usually custom resources, extending the API and adding their own functionalities, and then facilitating the potentially slower communication between the control plane and the nodes. So what I said earlier with the control plane, losing the control plane and your nodes don't work anymore. In this case, there is actually a built-in system to make sure this doesn't happen with device clones and the ability to keep the nodes operational even when the connection is lost, but um, it does depend on which version you're looking at. Not all of them are quite as advanced as the other ones. The last option with the minimal clusters like K0S and K3S, or with general just standalone clusters, it doesn't have to be minimal ones. Um, there's Kubernetes on this list as well because it doesn't come with an inbuilt admin cluster system. And it's the same for the, the cloud-based models, right? You have, you're not managing your GKE clusters from another cluster usually. Mobile Edge X provides a cloud-based management system and takes care of the cluster provisioning for you, but you still have to provide the underlying um, virtualization system to make sure that the clusters get created inside that virtualized environment. 
So that's it for these considerations. If we look at the infrastructure and the cost, so the left to right arrows don't necessarily mean good or bad or more or less, it's just left for the first one is proprietary, right one open source. And the middle ones don't mean they're like half-half, they mean pieces of it are open source or it's based on open source systems. And um, so you can see all the open source ones on the right. And something like OpenShift, for example, has so many um, operators that are open source or tooling that is open source. Same for Anthos, that you can consider it a strange hybrid of having to pay license fees, but still having a lot of open source in there. So these are things to consider with the cost. So you don't only have the infrastructure and hosting cost, but also the cluster operation and then potential licensing and support costs. So while you do get additional costs, you also get additional support with the proprietary version. So this is something uh, more of a trade-off than a good or bad thing. For, the, for another aspect for the cost is how much do you actually need in terms of resources? So this depends on your workloads, of course. So if you have gaming, for example, you will likely need larger nodes, uh, GPUs and or other enhancements for those nodes to make sure that the workloads are actually being processed properly. So then the smaller footprint versions probably won't be for you. But this is also something to take into account if you don't have many resources at the edge. So you might not be able to run a full Kubernetes cluster next to a sensor but K3S would be able to run as a single node deployment. Um, OpenShift, for example, is not the best version for having a small footprint because it just comes with so many added things to your Kubernetes cluster that you might not want to use it for a smaller thing like K3S that can also run on a Raspberry Pi. Kubech and OpenYard are also focused on providing a smaller footprint, especially on the edge nodes. So they don't change much about your control plane or um, central cluster um, in the cloud, but they do change a little bit on the edge node by replacing the kubelet with a smaller version, for example. So I think that's just cube edge. For the manageability, so the more Kubernetes API conform one of these options is, the easier it will be for you to switch from one platform to another. So if you're running something on Kubernetes, pure Kubernetes, you should be able to switch to all of the available options here, but it might not always be the other way around. So for example, OpenShift, if you have OpenShift specific um, YAML or resources, you might not be able to just go left to right to Kubernetes. For Robin.io, they have bundled workloads in a different way than the traditional deployments on Kubernetes. So this might also not be the easiest way to switch away from or switch to. MobileJX um, is fairly Kubernetes API conform, but also adds some um, uh, basically workload connectivity requirements for their SDK. GKE and EKS for workload side, very conform, but you won't be able to do a lot of things with the control plane that you might be able to change with all the complete open source versions on the right. The managed and self-hosted ones, this is also something that kind of ties into the cost, but you basically have the completely managed versions of GKE or EKS in the cloud. MobileJX has a control plane not reachable or reachable for it by you, but not hosted by you. So that one is taking care of your infrastructure. OpenShift is kind of a hybrid because you have a managed version, but you can also self-host. So this is kind of interchangeable. Same for Anthos and Robin.io. They kind of connect to, but are not self or are self-hosted by you still. And then you have all the completely open source ones, which are generally self-hosted, even though there are many providers out there that just basically do Kubernetes hosting for you as well. For flexibility and integration, so you have a choice between things that are a bit more standalone or fit into a larger ecosystem. So OpenShift, for example, comes with much tooling for install and management and add-ons and integration. 
but at the same time it is fairly limited to OpenShift. So you won't be able to create a normal Kubernetes cluster with OpenShift Hive. For everything in the middle, there is this open source component. So you have the community around it, you have people contributing and all the kind of tooling that comes with it, which often works with the other ones as well. So this is a nice piece that the community tools generally tend to work as long as the Kubernetes API is the same. And um, for GKE and Anthos, larger ecosystem in this case just means there is already this pre-built integration with the cloud, so you don't have to worry about this piece, but you don't get much more than that in um, terms of management. For the on-prem versus hybrid versus cloud, it's not that different from the managed versus self-hosted, but it is a little bit more on how do you actually run a cluster across those lines? So basically the fog version of it. Kubedge and OpenYort are more open for having nodes inside the same cluster, but across the lines. So basically nodes in on-premises and nodes in the cloud, while GKE EK is a completely cloud-based. Anthos is also same as OpenShift, the hybrid version. And Everything on the left is pretty much completely on-prem. While well, you can integrate so workload communication, of course, with the cloud, it's not as um, pre-integrated as some of the other ones. Additional considerations. So a lot of this is often managed by GitOps. You probably heard the buzzword and it's coming out of your ears by now. But the idea of having a declarative, auditable and facilitation of easier rollbacks by just having your current state of your environment in Git, having some sort of way of having it uh, in a control loop that actually makes sure that what you have in your Git is the version that you have in production and or development and or test, whatever your environment is. It is making it a lot easier to ensure that you're actually managing these things at the same time and correctly. So just to keep that in mind for not having, especially with edge nodes, right? You don't want to have some sort of imperative version where you have to apply an Ansible script and then go there and change something. And then maybe something changes on the way, but you will never find out because you didn't log on to the edge node ever. To the upscaling people is better than vendor lock-in part. This is something that I'm a firm believer in. So um, while it might be easier now to just go for the support version, generally it is better to teach people to manage their systems, how to go from there and um, how to deal with it yourself. Because while support will always be helpful, it might not always be helpful in time. But then again, I guess this is a question of how much money you can put into that. The maturity of tooling is another important aspect. So most of the options we looked at today are not that old. So from one to four years, I would say most of them go. Um, so the maturity of it can be, especially with the open source ones, not quite where you would expect them for an enterprise environment. And the last one, workloads, workloads, workloads. Well, I think this comes with it. You've seen that there's various different options out there. None of them are inherently better than the other ones, but they do depend on what are you actually running and what kind of workloads do you actually need, what kind of things in your platform. From that, um, so running Kubernetes in production, they said it will be easy, easy they said. I hope this helps a little bit to clear up the different aspects of what to consider when you are running your own Kubernetes platform at the edge. If it doesn't, thanks for listening anyway and ping me at tinydata42 on Twitter for comments, questions, complaints, concerns, whatever you can think of. Thanks everyone. <laughs>